welcome to the Green Ring, and thanks for watching this note-by-note -note dissection of Wagner's Der Ring des Nibelungen. This video is second in a series of 16 dedicated to Die Valkyrie Act I. Built on nearly two centuries of scholarly literature, it's a massive journey I hope you'll take, one I'm dedicated to finishing. For an explanation of who I am and more on the reasons for this series, please check the preface video first in a group of six building a foundation to this in-depth analysis. Before diving into this video, you may want to watch The Case for Erda, The Case Against Votan, and The Case for Loge, which present my views on how and why Wagner manipulates his musical syntax as he does, in the process identifying key morphemes which I believe define the entire work. You'll find explanations for why the terms leitmotif, motif, and motive have been replaced by morpheme, module, and cell in the chapter titled Music as Text. Links are provided in the comments below. My aim is to mount subsequent videos each week with breaks of approximately a month between each drama's acts until the entire ring is analyzed. We pick up where we left off in the prelude, following Timpani's thunderstroke triggered by the final Donner Pulse, page 15, second stave of Dover's full score. After a second timpanist concludes the last muffled grumble of thunder on a downbeat crotchet, the first sustained roll underpins low strings rumbling octavo through a pair of strokes recapping the prelude's first measures, identical but for chromatic twists complicating their rising and falling scales, timpani roll taking the place of six tuplet violin viola pulses. The struggle continues, if weakening, as the next measure initiates a series of twelve initial sign pulses, which, with the fifth, sink chromatically through five iterations, subtle mark of Siegmund's flagging strength. Lowered another half-tone, the module then repeats four additional times, without harmonic change, half the contrabasses having fallen out to emphasize this sense of decaying vigor. After these, contrabasses disappear, cellos alone twice repeating the complete initial bundle, meaning with its Velter triads restored, a ghost of renewed hope. It's at this point Wagner asks the curtain to open on Hunding's dwelling. Cellos telescope the prelude's initial bundle into a duo of rising six-note scales, the second reinforced by all contrabasses to climax forte piano on a single octavo dotted minim. The Meister specifically requests Siegmund to enter at this precise moment, which all the productions available on home video to this author ignore, lacking only Kupfer, who, for his 2003 Lisieux production, honors it to the letter. This is one of those instances where staging is pivotal in grasping the musical syntax, since it launches a morpheme crucial not merely to Siegmund's role in the drama, but the entire underlying questions of race and worldly power, an evolution of modules whose connotations are, or should be, firmly established. Two horns intone a Valhalla ash interval to underline both the Velsung's divine heritage and the danger into which he enters here, its double impacts adding a hint of the prelude's earlier menace. The Velsung's so-called personal morpheme is spottily appreciated by commentary, Volzogen grasping its relationship to the spear, as well as its evolution through the prelude storm modules, Newman giving an example without mentioning the spear, Hutchison following his lead. Cook does identify it with the spear, and Donington agrees in his own quirky fashion, while Holman relates it to the prelude syntax without making a spear connection, Spencer Millington's sight without comment. Sabor also grasps its spear link, though maintains his Volzogen-based confusion of that morpheme with the treaty. Alone among these, Kobe pays it no mind. 
It's something of a misnomer to view this syntax as a bona fide recurrent morpheme, since while it pervades the Sigmund Sieglinde dialogue until Hunding appears, to return a few times in the Velsung's narrative, it vanishes from the tetralogy after Act I. While it certainly characterizes the Velsung, it does so only in his present guise as an exhausted and hunted man, if built from and attended by a wealth of familiar material. Cellos outline its unnatural falling rising sign as it sinks spear-like on extended reverse melody notes, with which, in Rheingold, Wotan's adversaries progressively suggest to him a racial solution for his woes, not to mention its equivocal relationship to empathetic love. The module then passes through a dire inverted ash interval on air to chord notes only to be more hopefully contradicted by the Vala's melody notes. Violins, violas respond with a crescendo de crescendo on a natural rising-falling sign built contrapuntally from cells pregnant with ambivalent meaning. Its most prominent feature picks up the cello's ash interval by weaving the sign's ascent into a chain of chord notes, which detail catches Newman's eye. Those falling seconds which Wagner, in common with other composers, uses so frequently to express pain of body or soul that it is quite unwarrantable to pin them down rigidly to any one or anything particular in the drama. Pache Newman, this commentary ascribes court notes to Erda's behind-the-scenes exertions. As much as Wotan's proxy, Sigmund is the next pillar in the Earth Mother's covert agenda. He enters Hunding's dwelling for protection, the rising chord note chain a sign of hope as much as woe, that emotional parallax central to Erda's multifaceted nature, which encompasses servitude, the young Velsung beleaguered by Nibelung descendants, along with the Rhine Maiden's joy in their Rheingold, his race's potential for restoring that natural order. The sign's falling portion includes its most intriguing details. The continued cello line rises through an inversion of the ring fragment, a key module in the curse, complete with overlapping abandonment triads, that cell anticipated in violas. At a parallax, first violins underline its duality by intoning the ring fragment itself. In doing so, they reproduce that module's Veltherb triads, which in themselves have come to suggest Photon's hope for racial liberation. Again, thanks to his Rheingold observations of his adversary's struggle on that front. Second violins give this idea its imprimatur by capping their abandonment triad with a falling tritone, violas sliding down another set of reverse melody notes. First violins closing the period with the last chord note strophe, which, together with their ring fragment, evokes Albrecht's own racial hopes. As a frequent reminder, such inner workings of Wagner's counterpoint remain opaque to theater audiences, enumerated here for the edification of scholars and interpreters seeking a deeper grasp of the Meister's inner thought processes. The cello cell characterizes Sigmund's deeply ambivalent role in the drama. Wagner gives Siegmund a theme derived from the spear motive, implying that he is far from being a free agent. Trained by his father to oppose the gods, the young hero is actually an innocent, doomed by their anti-natural rule, an unwitting pawn to forward their ends among mortals, hence his morpheme's subtle resemblance to the ring, golden apples, and other prominent anti-natural falling, rising sine waves, most pointedly among them the sword, which finally spells his end. Additionally, the bundle surrounding his entrance mirrors that unique falling rising falling sign which, in Rheingold, suggests the conflict between a will to power and nature's dictates, an irony the Velsung's fate underlines. Though Siegmund himself doesn't know it, the Spear's laws eventually force him to trigger the destruction of Wotan's will to power, as embodied both in his spear and the sword he gives his son. 
Meant to redeem the gods' hopes, Sigmund ends by damaging them as much, if not more, than does Alberich's ring. This paradox, all thanks to the spear wrested from Erida's world ash, further implies her plans as foreshadowed in the Act I prelude. That vibrant portrait of nature's hostility to divine power lust, its earthly incarnations, and the unique racial mix from which those spring, hints at a mysterious yet bold new path charted for each. Valkyr Act I, however, belongs to the claims of love, and while those take stage, the spear plays a subtler role. Clandestine variants on the Act I prelude translated into other sophisticated modules. Wotan's power schemes instead find their overt reflection in the sword, whose morphine supersedes that of the spear, just as, for the first act at least, Siegmund overshadows Wotan. With the god's weapon out of sight and the sword yet to be heard, an audience focuses on this quite new character stumbling into view, even as the Meister's developing syntax keeps its eye on deeper layers of meaning. Horns again punctuate the Zygmunt module's second iteration with another octavo Valhalla ash interval as second violins' violas fall silent, leaving first violins to hold their semi breve then, urging the Zygmunt morpheme forward, lift through melody note pulse, which cellos echo with their own strophe of that module. This chord note melody note violin line, while mirroring the prominent cellos, does so by sketching the truncated giant turn, which in Rheingold marks Fassold's hopeless love for Freya, that cell to play a subtle role in this act than a more crucial one in Act Three. Violins, violas rise again into an up-down sign very like that with the Siegmund Morpheme's initial pulse. Rather than ascend in a curse-like inverted ring fragment, cellos intone a pure ash interval on an octave. As horns growl another Valhalla ash interval, echoed in violas on the next up downbeat, the cello line extends its Sigmund spear module, second violins harmonizing at a slight parallax across a full octave span into that same ominous inverted ash interval. The morpheme's melody notes are replaced by the second pure interval, countering the inverted, then slide down through another octave span punched by horns Valhalla ash interval, second violin's harmony doubled by violas, into its inverted interval, countered by the melody notes and a third pure interval, reinforced in contrabasses. The three pure intervals, if more separated than in the prelude, nonetheless imply this stranger must bear some unique relationship to that natural energy in its untainted state. Newman argues too much meaning is assigned to the urgent layered Erdo chord note repetitions, dismissing them as a common 19th century device for sadness and longing. Over the course of Alcur, however, rising successions of court notes convey far more than melancholic yearning, often signaling the exact opposite. While the court notes imply he's destined to change his divine forebears profoundly, if not happily, taken with his morpheme's fallen rise and the giant turn, Zygmunt's role in this new world is made ambivalent by his syntax's relationship to Rheingold's primitive beastmen. Though unwittingly torn between Erda's will and that of the god, he's nonetheless destined for a higher place in her schemes. If at first glance perplexing, other aspects of Siegmund's musical signature have their origins in a Rheingold syntax. Stage directions ask the Velsung to enter Hunding's dwelling mit den äußersten Anstrengungen eines Todmüten. The eight climactic measures prior to his first vocal note driving home what the stage directions ask. The Velsung scans the dwelling as nervous brass pulses rifle his wordless search to reflect the prelude's threatening double impacts, shaped as Valhalla ash intervals, hinting at Siegmund's divine pedigree. 
This and their equally ominous ascent through an abandonment triad raises the unnerving prospect the immortals are set against him, a notion he himself develops in his coming backstory monologue. Beneath them, octavo low strings repeat four Welter triads, the same as are hidden in his eponymous personal morphemes counterpoint, subtly affected here in first violins layered with second violin chords. After its birth in the ring, this module is integral to Wotan's image of his own might, then suggests the magic of Albrecht's ring-gotten power, fascinating the god during his Nibelheim visit as he observes its power over Albrecht's subjugated minions. Once he defeats the malign dwarf, it energizes the curse's threat, then adheres to the giants contaminated by the Horde. Revived in the Act One prelude, then attached to the Velsung, it continues its associative development through the epic's remainder, moving at last from the Devingod twins to their offspring, Siegfried. This triad cell, with the ring's essential power, that of the dwarves hardened by its tyranny, the giant's rough, independent nobility, mixed with fierce brutality fighting to seize that energy, here attaches to Wotan's proxy for defeating the mortal forces opposing him, fighting fire with fire through his demigod spawn. Zygmunt's ostensible task, seizing back the ring, comes with a strong racial undercurrent that grows ever more powerful as Valkyrie continues. Nor are Erda and through her Loge far from this scheme, who make their unseen presence felt as the Velderb triad morphs into first violin succession of plunging sevenths, echoed at a parallax by octavo low strings to evoke the fire god's manipulative cunning. Preceding them, violin viola chords echo the prelude's double impacts, opposing Zygmunt's flight, capped in air to chords. These last four identical measures' relentless pounding underlines the hero's exhaustion while driving their syntactic message into an audience's subconscious. But whether the Vala's covert influence through her acquiescent fire god is for the good or ill of Wotan's plans remains to be seen. That's it for now. My aim is to keep these videos close to a half hour instead of the longer ones which make this a more of an endurance test than it should be. The next video picks up where this one leaves off, Zygmunt's first line on the top stave of page 18 in Dover's full score. As always, thanks for watching and please do leave your comments below. Time and energy allowing, I'll do everything I can to respond. Lastly, as all YouTubers know, your subscription to this channel by itself is a huge assist in completing this vast project. Hit the bell to be notified of the next videos. With luck and your support, there's a lot more to come.